My name's Bob Woodfill, and we're at the uh, fall shoot for the NMLRA uh, down in Friendship, Indiana. And uh, I'm going to give you a little history on my background down here. I've been coming here for over 50 years. In fact, I started in 1957 and had a booth down in the sheep shed. And in the sheep shed, that was in the days when you could sell all kind of stuff. And I was, uh, see, I was a junior in high school and I came over here and these guys had muzzle loaders and they had ramrods and they had all kind of stuff. And I was just, oh, I was in seventh heaven. And I got to see a lot of the old guys. Bill Large was here, John Baird and uh, uh, Tom Dawson and all the guys, they were dealing in Hawkins in the 1960s and 70s. And it was the hottest item here. I mean, it was better than sliced bread. And uh, I kind of listened to these guys. And of course, I was just a junior in high school, but I acquired a little bit of money. And uh, through the years, I probably built over a hundred Hawking rifles. And some I built are copies of originals and some are modern S. Hawkins that guys go hunting with. And uh, I've had Bill Large barrels, rice barrels, Sharon barrels, all kind of barrels. We've used all those. But anyway, through the years, I've kind of favored the Hawking rifle. And we, we, we basically have a minor problem today that really high quality Hawking rifles can be built through kits. And the kits will cost $1,500, $1,600 and a completed rifle will cost $3,000, $4,000, $5,000. In fact, Bob Browner just sold one at the CLA for $10,500. And if you're a, a youth or a beginner and you want a Hawken rifle, a true Hawken rifle, you're kind of limited in what you can get today because as you see here by the dealers, they don't sell a lot of parts. And back in the 70s and 80s, they were just hundreds of parts out here because it was the thing with Robert Redford in 19, uh, what was it, 72, did uh, Jeremiah Johnson. Yeah, that's the one there. But anyway, uh, I built this rifle. Uh, I spoke first to uh, Ian Yazel, and I says, Ian, we've got a problem here. Uh, our youth, our, our beginners, can't afford these $3,000 up rifles. And, and all these beginner rifles are got brass fittings and I don't like the looks of them and they're not really copies of original Hawken. And what do you think is the best one that comes the closest? And Ian said, well, the one that comes the closest is this one called the Invest Arms Gimmer Hawken. And it's, it's a pretty nice little kit. Uh, it gives you a 32 inch 50 caliber barrel, a 130, 160 twist. And I took the parts, this rifle that I'm holding right here was made from that very kit. I purchased the kit, rifle kit and with the intention of making it look like an original Hawken. And basically they didn't look like a Hawken, but most of the problems were in the design of the wood or the stock. And I'm going to talk to you about a few features of the stock here in a minute in detail, but I'll just give you an overall deal. The wood on these, they're too big, they're too bulky, they're too blocky, and they don't look like a Hawken. And nine out of ten guys out here can try to make a Hawken, but if you don't have an original Hawken land in front of you, where you can see three dimensions, not two dimensions, three dimensions, you're not gonna be able to make a Hawken. Because there's certain little lines and certain little features on original Hawkins, and you can learn it, but it takes a little time. So I've spent the last 50 years doing this. <laughs> so anyway, uh, uh, Ethan says, okay, go ahead and we'll do a little, uh, little video or something of this when you get done. Okay, well I took this rifle and it was very bulky in this area. It's very bulky in this area. The stock came out here a quarter of an inch beyond that. And I used a rasp and I evened it off because there is a straight line that goes from here to here. 
but it kind of bows out just a little. And you don't want it so it reflects light. It has to be bigger in this area than here and here. But that line that comes up through there. So first I constructed that line, okay? The next line I constructed was the line from the top of the butt plate, the toe, up here to the comb is another straight line. And of course, our Italian friends who make this, I think Pedrosoli makes these, don't they? Uh, I, I Invest Arms is on their own. Oh, they're on their own. Okay, I'm sorry, Invest no, Arms. Okay. Well, this needs to be a straight line. And so I made that a straight line, got rid of more wood. And then I went down here and I, I, I really, this, they overdid it down here. The line on the top of this up here to the back of the, the guard is also a straight line. Well, it extended out about three-eighths of an inch and they had a fish belly in there. And of course, I took that and cut that off, reset this, and made this into a straight line. And you can see, it's, it's just like the difference that, you know, there's beautiful women, there's really beautiful women. And those lines are important, exactly the ones that need to be there. So anyway, we got this taken care of. We came over on this side of the stock. Now this is the cheek paste part. And fortunately, they left a lot of wood in this area. And it was real blocky. I mean, it was real blocky. Well, I carved it to look like an 1850s S. Hawken. And an 1850s S. Hawken, this is an oval starting up here. It comes around. There's a straight line, and then it goes down halfway into the grip. And most people don't know that because they don't look at original Hawkins. But I put that line in here, and it's very subtle. It's very subtle. It's there, and if you turn it, you can see it. And in fact, when I, when I do my finishing, I rub that, and that'll come out a white line, just like the edge of this, and it goes right up there. And that's important. You can tell from, you know, what, what needs to be said on that. Okay, well, I got this side carved out, came up here. <coughs> the, the lock, the lock area, the, the lock plate uh, wood was about an inch longer and an inch longer here. Well, I cut that way back. Hawken, generally a line around here, no more than an eighth of an inch and oftentimes less. That's all the thickness that needs to be in here. The line here from the edge of this is a straight line down to the trigger guard plate. And it was big and bowed out. You've got to get rid of wood, get rid of wood, get rid of wood. And you get this nice feature. And then when you rub it, you're finishing it, those lines, you rub them and they show up. Okay, and I made this with a double pointed. There's a point here and a point here. That's the way S. Hawkins, Sam made them in the 1850s. This comes down to a point, this comes to a point, and that point. And I have a, uh, oh, a profile or whatever you want to say. I, I've got on a piece of plexiglass that I took off an original one. And I laid that right on there. So that's exactly from original 18, 1850s Hawking. And it fit. And I says, okay, so I started cutting around here and did all this. And I got the lock plate way I want it. It looks nice. It's not overbearing, but it's protective to the lock. Okay. The next thing I did was I turned the gun over and I made a tracing of that, put it on here and made it exactly over here. And if you'll look at all these uh, beginner guys, they'll have one lock plate doesn't match the other and one's forward and one's backwards. Nah, Hawkins were really good. The Hawkins boy, Sam and Jake, were from Switzerland, and they were actually Swiss craftsmen, and they hired a lot of German craftsmen. And these guys were really good woodworkers, high quality, the best in St. Louis. So, okay, you get this, and then the next thing was, on this particular gun, uh, the, the way the kit was laid out, the key excursions here were down about an eighth of an inch. They were about down about an eighth of an inch to the wood. And the uh, uh, barrel key excursions fit those. So if you put them down and you reduce the wood to that level, it'd be about as thin as a uh, squirrel hole rifle. So I filled that with epoxy, brought that up level, 
and then I uh, put it lettered the barrel key uh, barrel key excursions in, and then I put the little little screws in there. And I might just tell people that these are always bright, and once they're put in, Hawk can never take them out. He never took them out and browned the keys or the screws. Once they're in, they're filed down, that's where they are. You leave them there, and that's why they're always bright on all these guns. And, ah, and that was a characteristic of the Hawking guns. It had two barrel keys, and people could see them, you know. So we're, we're good with that. We came ahead on up here, and actually this nose cap is made out of steel. It's made out of steel. It's not a casting. This was a hole in which they had a wire went completely through and came out over here. And I didn't like that, so I just kind of glued that on. And actually, Hawkins were made out of sheet metal, and they came over top that. And the later ones during this period were made out of iron, sheet iron. The earliest ones were cast, and they were cast out of pewter. But these weren't, and they had this distinctive geometry. It came around here, a little cut out here, and all that. So I was able to hold authenticity through this area. And then this was simply polished bright, and it was put on the gun. Some people say, oh, they're made out of silver, and some others, they were made out of, I don't know, nickel or whatever. And that's not true. They were just polished bright, and that's all they were. And they will gradually get dirty, and, and they were uh, oxidized and get darker with time. I left the little uh, thimbles up here about where they should be. Actually, the first thimble is always back four inches from the end of the muzzle, always. The front sight is always, the center of the front sight is always back one and one half inches from the end of the muzzle. And I didn't move these, I did move these. They're a little bit off for authenticity. But they're, they're pretty good, they're pretty good. And I left the ramrod on here. The last thing that I did on finishing up this gun was I opened up the lock, got inside, and tuned it. I polished all the parts, made sure everything was fit, you know, and all that, and just, you know, made sure it worked. Now. This lock is a pretty good lock, and I say pretty good, that's a little less than best and a whole lot less than the very best. And you can get an LNR replacement lock for this if you want another $130. But I didn't want to spend any money, but this, this, this will work fine for a kid or a, you know, a beginner, and you're in good shape. It's got the full cock, everything works. The last thing I did was come down, not the last thing, but one next thing I did, was come down here, take the double set triggers out, and they were they were square. There was no contour to them. See how they're contoured in which they're smooth on this side and they taper off on both sides there? They were just pieces of metal came out there. Well, I took my grinder and I shaped those and then I rehardened them and I polished them. And now they look like Hawking triggers. And then I tuned them and got everything right. And actually you can adjust this one down here by pulling the back trigger, the front one, to lessen the pound. And I figured this was going to a youth, so I left it at about two and a half pounds. But the trigger can be made. Now, the finish of the, of the gun was a bit of a challenge, and I told Ian about this. This finish is some kind of Italian something. And the closest thing that I have they ever worked on in this country is ash in which you have the alternating hard and soft ribs. And it was that way. And it was a challenge to sand it and stain it and do all that. But you're, this is what you got, so we got to work with it. Here's what I did. I took, after I sanded it, and of course I start 120, 220, 320, 400, down to 600, and then I wet and dry it twice, raise the grain before I put any stain on. I did that, it got it worked down to where I wanted it, and so I'm ready for the stain. And I only use one stain, and Homer Dangler used to have a booth right over here. He was right next to me. And Homer Dangler is the best stain that I know of. And why it's best stain that I work with, and suits my purposes, is it works with uh, linseed oil. 
it's it's not a water-based oil. It's an alcohol-based oil, and you can mix it even with. Oh yeah, true oil or uh, all the different uh, you know linseed-based oils. Okay. Anyway, after I got it sanded down, the grain raised, I put one coat of Homer Dangler's dark brown on it, and it was kind of light. And I said, Nah, it's not dark enough. So I put another one on, and it was good, but not good enough. And then. I washed Ian, not Ian, but Ethan. That's okay. He did some uh, bone black type uh, darking. Well, I did that with the Homer Danglers. And what I use is a wool swab on, a, on the end of a uh, piece of metal. And I do that back and forth. And it goes beautiful with later oil, like true oil. Okay, so I use Homer Dangler dark brown. Is stained. I put that on, I rubbed it where I wanted. Now, where I want it to be a little lighter here to show wear, and a little here, I just took a little four aught steel wool and rubbed a little off the top. Okay, the next thing is I'm ready to put the finish on, both the uh, sealer and the finish. And for me, my purposes, uh, everything I do is uh, Birchwood KC True Oil. And true oil is nothing more than boiled linseed with a dryer, and that's all it is. But it's clear, it works fine. Okay, I put a, I normally put four to six coats on, and I did that and filled it up, which covered the stain. Now, the best thing is, if later on you say you want to make a little darker around here, with Homer Danglers, you can rub a little in there of Homer Danglers, and it'll make it dark on top of your, your sealer. And then just put a little more sealer in and rub it. Or if you get a ding, and of course, Hawkins need a lot of dings on them or imperfections. Uh, if you get a ding or something, all you do is rub a little true oil on, take a little four watt steel wool or a soft rag and rub it. You got it, it cleans it up. Now, my philosophy on Hawkins rifles is their, uh, it should look like they've been out in the desert and to the mountains for a hundred years and somebody's taken care of them. And I always want one that is bright on the inside of the lock, the triggers, and a perfect barrel. But the outside I want to look pretty rough. I want it to look rough like Jim Bridger had it and he just gave it to the museum or something of this variety. So I will go back and I will ding this. I didn't do this one because this... Uh, uh, a boy, give us to a boy. But anyway, uh, I ding these, I scrape them, I scratch them, I rub them, I look like, uh, make them look like they're really old time. And that's the way I like them. I call it antiquing them. And this has got just a little bit of the antiquing on, but not a lot. So anyway, that, oh, well, I should tell you about the finishing. Okay, on the barrel, I fire blue the uh, barrel. It's a fire blue deal. And what it is, fire blue, it's not like the modern rust blue where they use chemicals and that. The old guys back in those days fire blued them by doing this. They would brown them. They were brown. You have the brown, but you just drop them over in the tank and boil them and they turn black. And you do that three or four times, but each time you take some four hot steel wool and wipe this off, and it becomes a very nice satin finish in which you can rub the corners and make it look old. And that's how I fire blew them, and that's how Sam Hawkins fire blew them the same way. The final thing is on this is the lock, the hammer, the trigger, sometimes the trigger guard were what we call forge hardened. And in the old days, they just put it in the forge hardened it up, dropped it in some water and salt or whatever it was, and it hardened up. And it's always gave this gray color. This always gave this gray color. Well, I don't do that because I don't necessarily need these parts to be that hard. But what I do is, and I can't remember, I think it's ortho blue that Brownells has. It's a liquid, it's a cold liquid. And I take this, I rub it on and I rub it off. I rub it on and rub it off. And you can create the same colors as a fire blued, case hardened, 
breech, hammer, lock, triggers, and so forth. And so, anyway, that is kind of a summary, very quick, of how we've turned a kit gun into a easily priced gun that it looks like a hawk and it's not perfect not perfect but i would be glad to hunt with this rifle and it looks like a hawk and maybe the next step up after 10 years the gentleman might want to buy another one a little more expensive or something but he can be very proud of this i would be happy to go into the woods hunting with this rifle and so i believe this offers the youth or the beginner today with an opportunity to buy a gun that's simple, you follow the rules, and if you read the September issue of Muzzle Blast, which is just coming out, I just wrote a three-page article on this on how to do it. And you just follow the rules, and there you are. So I, I appreciate uh, everything here. I appreciate the people that taught me how to make these. I appreciate Ethan uh, Yazel who suggested I enter this project and I'm very excited that a youth will be going into the woods this fall with this gun looking for an elk in Colorado. Oh, Caroline, big girl. Oh, big girl. Oh, big girl. I was you. I'd get tired. I'd want to go take a nap. I think she will here. She's probably going to crash. <laughs> She's kind of tired, huh?